a small break and we welcome Glenda to the podium with 4.01 and board members these are items that we will consider uh, at our business meeting that's correct um, good evening. The st state, state Board policy actually mandates that every year uh, we, br we bring to the Board of Education for approval our beginning teacher support plan. So what I'm going to highlight for you tonight is the plan that we have here in Cabarrus County. And as you can see from our slides here, there are several key personnel that are responsible for implementing the beginning teacher support plan and for the oversight. And that starts in the HR department uh, and includes myself and uh, Dr. Marion Bish, our executive director of personnel services, and our teacher support coordinator, Teresa Abernathy, down to our school-based administrators, our lead mentors, and our mentors. Uh, our mission obviously in Central Cabarrus uh, schools is to help our beginning teachers to be prepared to meet the challenges that they're going to face and one of the things that was especially um, uh, sweet tonight was um, Patty Norris and her testimony as a 31 year teacher um, and just listening to her made me think about our plan here and what we need to be doing and focusing on so that we can keep these beginning teachers for those 31 years and not see them fall off by the wayside after five years. If you look at our new employee orientation, uh, we are charged each year with providing this to our beginning teachers and be beginning teachers being those in years one, two, and three. We have a three-day orientation. It will actually begin next week. It will start on Monday. It starts the week before the teachers are actually required to come back for their first work day. Uh, we will have that three day. The first day will be to all those that are uh, new to the district in addition to our first year teachers in second and third year. Uh, we will also have day two that's a focus on curriculum and uh, day three will be breakout sessions to meet the individual needs of the diverse lear learners and it will focus on uh, classroom management. One of the things that we're really changing in our plan this year that we just wanted to highlight for you is the amount of support we're giving our lateral entry teachers, those teachers that come in uh, via a non-traditional route. Uh, one of the things that um, our, especially CTE, and with our career technical educations where you see a lot of those alternative licensure folks come in and they're not getting the methodology coursework you would get in a traditional program. So our CTE directors along with our beginning teacher support coordinator are actually collaborating to provide some additional support sessions uh, this year for our beginning teachers. As you can see here, we have a lot of support from the community. Last year, our luncheon was sponsored by um, Honey Baked Ham, and we just got the great news this week that Doe Girls will be sponsoring the uh, luncheon for this year. And if those of you that attended the Teacher of the Year banquet, those, that was who um, actually provided the food for us uh, at the Teacher of the Year banquet. And you'll see the next picture here, our folks enjoying last year's Honey Baked Ham. The, as you can see on this particular slide here, uh, we, we have the first three days and then the last two days of, t of teacher orientation, which is really more those informal days. Our teachers go back to the building level and actually work uh, in their classrooms with their building level mentors. From a district level support, as I talked about earlier, um, Human Resources is actually responsible for the oversight of the um, teacher support program here for beginning teachers. And uh, one of the things that we spend time doing is making sure that our beginning teachers have uh, the, uh, the appropriate number of observations, that they have their summatives, that we're in compliance from a licensure standpoint, and then helping to clear those licenses after they're into year three there. And uh, the other part of that is compliance for Title II and making sure that we have what we need from an audit standpoint. We also make sure we're training those mentors, our school-based mentors. Uh, it, since spring, the spring uh, semester of 2011, when the mentor standards were updated, we've actually trained 479 mentors, and every year we offer additional training sessions in the fall and spring. Our school-based support 
in looking at this, you'll note that uh, our building level administrators spend a great deal of time making sure that they assign the appropriate mentor to our beginning teachers. We try to make sure that they are of uh, the light like content area as, as often as possible, even grade levels. We also try to make sure through our building level assurances that um, the appropriate coaching is provided there and that extracurricular duties are assigned if those begin beginning teachers request it because that's one of the things is protecting their time there. At, as the lead mentor and mentor responsibilities there, the lead mentor and mentor provide personalized support. Uh, the, we look at specific characteristics for these mentors, as I spoke of earlier about certification area, and you certainly want someone like the Patty Norris's of the world who have that enthusiasm for teaching to be, our, be mentoring our beginning teachers. Evaluation of our beginning teachers, that begins at the very beginning of the year or right shortly after they're hired. If, they're, if it's during the school year, they have to have a 10-day orientation, and uh, that's done at the building level. They complete a self-assessment, and all of this is um, mandated by general statute, and they're trained on this process. They do a professional development plan. They're required to have three full observations by their administrator, a peer observation, and a summative. Our mentor and uh, beginning teacher standards there, again, that just highlights the fact that about the self-assessment which we discussed and how our um, building level administrators really work with our beginning teachers in coaching them through their professional development plan and, and providing the building level resources that these teachers need to grow. And then finally at the end here, we see that um, Learning's not attained by chance, but it must be sought for with ardor and attended to with diligence. And I believe that's what we're doing with our beginning teacher support plan. And as we look at our multi-tiered plan that we have in support uh, in place to support our beginning teachers, as they they work to attain that continuing license in year three, one of the critical things that we must continue to do, not just as a department but as a district, is to support our teachers um, just in every way possible. And I, I truly believe Cabarrus County Schools goes way and above in that arena. All right, questions? Fantastic. Thank you, Glenda. Okay, board members, uh, uh, this was in a Friday report, I believe, two weeks ago. So we've, so you've had this and you've seen it. Any any further questions, and we'll do this kind of rapid fire. Jeff, David, Lynn, Rob, Barry, you got one? Go ahead, Dr. Uh, Mr. Shoemaker. Who is, our, who is our critical friend? Very good question. <clears throat> critical friends, they started this a couple years ago where you, you're actually your – plan is peer reviewed and this last time Stanley County and Lincoln County I believe were our peer review um, partners our critical friends and we come together and take each one of the plans and there's a rubric and then we look to look through the rubric to see if we've actually met or proficient or higher and, and we've been proficient and higher so there we that they were our last critical friends. They were, and we've not gotten a new assignment okay, yet. So we have, okay, so you don't know who this year's will no, be. No, sir, don't know who that will be this next time. No, they're normally in a District 6 group. I'm sorry, it's usually three. We, we try, and they try to do like size, but they, it, and neither one of those districts are like size with us. Right. So typically it becomes a proximity issue so that these counties can get together, their teacher coordinators, their HR personnel, and sit down and just really evaluate the plans. It's a collaborative effort. It's, you know, you're not really, it's not a, a grade per se, but it's more if there's some areas that we need to work on and grow, then we can do that through collaboration with peer districts. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right, board members, action or consent? Everybody okay? We have to approve the uh, plan. Everybody okay for consent? Nod of the heads? Yeah. Consent. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much, Glenda. We will move on to 4.02, and we will welcome Sue Burns to the podium. And we will talk about a handful of policies on first reading. Right. Good evening. Um, the following policies are being recommended for first read. I'm going to go through the list and just the, the quick summary and then take any questions you might have. The first one is policy 1200, governing principal student success. The only change removes reference to the deleted policy 7410 career status and adds reference to the new policy 7410 teacher contracts. I tell you what, Sue, so instead of going, you going through them all and then us backtracking, uh -huh. we'll stop. Anybody okay. have a question with that one? 
Rob? Uh, there's one glaring policy that's not in here. Governing principle, student success. One glaring policy. Well, which one is that? Uh, that would be 44,000. 4, focus on students. Okay. That needs to be in there. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, um, uh, okay. Well, that, that that's fine. Is there any reason? Does anybody have any? You have any objection to adding it? Or I don't, Mark, do you have any? No. no. Well, okay. I mean, if our point is student success, or we need to be focusing on students. Okay. Well, I thought there might be some reason that it's not there. If it's not, then not that's fine. Help. We'll add that. Okay. All right. Move on to sixteen hundred. All right. Governing principle professional development also removes the reference to deleted policy career status and adds reference to new policy seventy four ten teacher contracts. So it's the same as the one before. Board members, any questions or comments on 1600? Nope. Okay, we'll move on to 4120. Okay, domicile or residence requirements modifies the provision regarding the assignment of students who are homeless to clarify that such assignments must be made in accordance with the requirements established in 4125. And that changes on page two. It just um, adds in accordance with policy 4125 homeless students. Okay, so it's just adding a reference. Mm -hmm. Okay, any comment or question on that one? Nope. Okay. okay. 4333. This is, e this is easier than I thought. Okay. Uh, um, 4333 oh, weapons, so. bomb threats, terrorist threats, and clear threats to safety. Adds gunpowder, ammunition, and bullets to the list of examples of weapons. Extends prohibition against making terrorist threats to include threats made at school events off school property includes a minor editorial change and updates the legal reference. And these changes are, are on pages one and two of the policy. Okay, board members, any questions on that one? I'm not sure I totally buy that, but I'm not, we're not going to hang us up. I mean, actually holding a bullet is to not holding yeah. a weapon, but and then it, it's 10 o'clock. So. <laughs> well, and that is that piece. Some of the other ones are required. That that, that one that, is optional. That is an optional. The gunpowder, ammunition, and bullets. We we have actually had students bring bullets. So to yeah, I mean, there's so. no real reason to bring yeah. it. I suppose you could be. I could be convinced that if you had some sort of social studies project or something or another, an actual shell casing or something would go with that, and you might not think of that, and you'd show up, and then you'd have a. But, I mean, actually holding that is not really holding a weapon as it reads at the top of the weapons include without limitation. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm not too persnickety about it. I guess it's just. Well, well this, just maybe this might help you, Blake. Bullets do have gunpowder. They do have a cap. And if you break the bullet out of the shell, you expose the gunpowder and the cap, and it, and it definitely could cause problems. And so, I, I mean, I thought the same thing to start with, but when you think into it a little bit deeper, you know, it pot potentially could cause a problem. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Shoemaker. And this is a question for Mark. Why do we have to have terrorists in there? I mean, I don't know. I just, I just have this thing. Why are we killing this word? And why are we having this word? Why do we need this word? Because what, what, is, what is gained by terrorist threats? Because you haven't defined terrorist threat anywhere in this policy. To me, it, should, it doesn't need to be in there. It's any bomb, destructive advice, bomb, or actions that constitute clear safety to students and employees. Why do we need terrorist threat? I mean, I just don't see the need for it because I mean, it's clear safety to the employee. Right. I mean, to, to, to I think it was added in again. This is a this is a model policy, so it's not one we drafted. But I think the idea was, it was originally focused on bomb threats, and then there was a discussion of other terrorist threats. I'm thinking of anthrax in particular, that would be a terrorist threat that would not necessarily fit under the bomb threat. And so the idea would be to have something that would be you know, broader that might not be a bomb threat or some other threat. I, 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 I agree. I, your point about we don't really haven't defined what a terror, what terrorism is in this policy, at least, 
I think I mean, it's, me it's true. It's over, over, overuse of the word terrorist mm -hmm. when, when you, you pretty much have succinctly taken care of it with everything else. I just don't even see the need for that word in there. Because to me, we're lumping. Now we're entering into this world where, you know, terrorism is, seems to be the PC word of the day. And, but we don't define what it is, and yet we have it in our policy. And so now someone is going to have to define a terrorist threat. And I don't think that our school system should be in that business of defining terrorist threat. But we can say anything that have constituted direct safety to employees and students or anybody or guests on our property, that's a threat. And that's all we need to be concerned with. But to label something a terrorist threat is not our job. And I, and I just don't see the need, word, need for the word. Okay, so you don't want to change any of the word, and you just want to change the title of the policy. I, I just want to take terrorist out Is of the first paragraph and terrorist out of the policy because I just don't see a need for the word. Uh, I missed it in the, the, so um, the first. I missed it in the policy. Right. The, oh, the I say, yeah, right, the first sentence. The footnote for, for that, for terrorist threats in the um, um, school board association um, model that they sent says, um, under general statute 14277.5b, a person who by any means of communication to any person or group of persons makes a report knowing or having reason to know the report is false that an act of mass violence is going to occur on educational property or to curricular or extracurricular activity sponsored, sponsored by the school is guilty of a class H felony. And then it defines mass violence, is defined as physical injury that a reasonable person would conclude could lead to the permanent injury, including mental or emotional or death of two or more people. I don't know if that helps any. Should we, should we put something in there that defines what that is so we have a clue? Because, I mean, this policy, nothing says anything about what you've said. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing. So are we to but assume it's a, that it's a footnote and it's, re it's, it's a footnote and it's referenced is what she said. Um, yeah, it's the footnote in the, um, the copy that the school board association sends us, so we don't put footnotes in our actual board policy. Right. But that see, was I didn't see it in here. That's what yeah. I'm saying. There's nothing that well, gave me that. Can, then, can then, then, under the legal reference, that then does there really any reason not to put it under the legal reference? If we're going to, yeah, yeah, then it's tied mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Okay. If we do that, can we, then provide, I'll a, can we provide a link to it as well? Well, yeah. that's what he said. It it, yeah. it does have a link. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everybody, okay, okay. with that? So we can add the legal reference from the, the statute cited in that footnote. We'll put in the legal reference in this policy. Yeah, yeah. I think that helps me. That helps me. I think that's appropriate. Right. I just I just thought that this was arbitrary in the way it was. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to ninety two twenty. Okay. Uh, 9220 Security of Facilities adds new statutory information about providing local law enforcement with schematic diagrams of school facilities and keys to the main entrance of school facilities. This is required. Includes emergency management agencies in the above requirement for schematic diagrams. Makes minor editorial changes and updates the legal reference, which is also required. Um, under the notes, it also says that the information is the same as the update to policy 1510-4200-7270, um, which we did earlier this year. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Walter, you got a comment? Yeah, under item number, uh, number two, mm -hmm. where it says determine the needs and responsibilities of security personnel, can we add in law, school law enforcement, SRS? since we now have, have them in all our schools. But I don't think we're allowed to do that. <clears throat> That's the responsibility of the sheriff or the um, I mean, specific functions. The, you know, it's not that, well, I'm not sure exactly how quite to word that. But Security personnel, um, does that, would that, what would an SRO qualify as a security personnel? If it would, I think we should at least reference that because we do have, we do have, uh, folks now in all our schools. I mean, I would, I would think the answer that would be yes, that an SRO would be a, included in, the, in security personnel. If so included, do we need to change any language, or are they, they covered with what we're trying to do and what we are trying to accomplish by wording it the way we've worded it? No, I'm saying does it... I'm okay with... I think I'm okay with adding a number two where it says security personnel comma, including school resource officers, 
to, to Rob's point that that may be often the security personnel at site to make it clear that's what we're talking about if it wasn't okay um, I don't I'm okay with that okay everybody okay with that well I just I, I just want to bring it so we're saying that dr. Shepard is going to determine the responsibilities of SROs who actually work for the sheriff's department or the police department and I think that their responsibilities are determined by their bosses and we're not their bosses neither is dr. Shepard so if we can at least just get a clarification on that which to me brings up the question whether or not our SROs abide by their professional training as police officers and sheriff's deputies or whether they act according to our policies I mean I don't know that there's a one for one uh, match or even a review by SROs for, of, of That's our a policies. Good, maybe a good question for you the guys question. to have at the policy committee. Yeah, and we actually and, have a pretty good memorandum of understanding that sets out some of the responsibilities of the SRO in the connection with the school. So that's an issue that we've spent some time talking about with uh, resource officers and with some of our staff too. So I mean, it's a good question. You know, what hat are they wearing and what role they are filling? So. And they do do some, they help the schools, and they've also got an independent law enforcement role that they um, play that's not part of the schools. So that is actually pretty well defined. But um, okay. I, I get, <clears throat> but you know, to, to Jeff's point, I think a general question about the superintendent determining the need for security personnel may be, uh, to me, what I would envision is saying, well, we need a an SRO in the school without necessarily saying the SRO shall you know patrol this hall or do the kind of things that I think you may be worried about about giving some specific direction on how to provide safety so and that's really what I think has happened you know in terms of security when we had security concerns there was a plan to say well let's look at security cameras and vestibules and SROs that's kind of our approach so we that I do think that is part of the recommendations you've heard about um, you know security personnel I don't know that we have a lot of other non SRO security personnel to my knowledge although I don't look around but I, I'm not aware of us having we don't have other school <coughs> employees that um, are security I mean we have some facility people that would do some of the security but we don't really well, have a security force why don't we do this why don't we put that on action and if you want to clarify this week and then next week if we can put it on consent or if we need to vote on it separately we we'll just clarify if, if we gain anything by adding verbiage for there or if we need to leave it alone because yes there is some sort of separation we need to keep the SRO off there okay all right I think that's it that's it thank you very much thank you, thank you Sue. we will move on to 4.03 uh, board members some I can't remember when uh, I got off June 2nd it says when we voted for the revised board calendar we did not have times for the community meetings so the superintendent uh, at our agenda meeting we had a discussion about the times and decided that we thought 630 was an appropriate time six o'clock being too early for people to get there that 630 to 8 an hour and a half was plenty of time and so we have added the specific times to the calendar so we need to approve the board calendar with the actual times in it so does anybody have any question um, uh, uh, hold on one second so we'll we'll go I was just going to open it real quick couldn't get my no, that's not what I want. okay so um, the other thing that we did talk about was that the November trying to do one in November may be problematic because of uh, the NCSBA and because of Thanksgiving so that has been left is to be determined um, you guys want well, to have a specific hold on if you want to add a specific date or if we want to talk about this now and have one we can insert one if we don't we can push it off Doc, Mr. Shoemaker's got a suggestion of uh, doing it at a later date and I'll let you uh, present that well one of the things that we discussed was because we we're just now beginning our design effort with the Mount Pleasant Middle School it would be nice to have that effort done so that when we meet with them we can actually meet with them and talk about 
what their new school would look at look like and that kind of thing and have something to meet with them about and so that would November they I do not I do not believe the architect will be complete with the design effort by by November and so we might end up having this in January not that we want to take it off but we just put it to be determined so that it was still out there we just may have to move the day we we'll have to move the date around once we have some better information but I'd rather meet with them with something in hand and have a conversation with with, with the, the folks in Mount Pleasant rather than to just go there and and, and just sit in a room and talk about something that we don't have any information to give them. Okay. Huh? okay, well, hold on. Before we go into discussion, now proceed. It's an I'm supportive of that because we, you know, that's part one of the main reasons of holding it in Mount Pleasant was to be able to provide the uh, citizens information on that school. Any other question or comment, uh, Jeff, David, or Lynn? Well, the only comment that I might add is the dynamics of the board might change between now and January, and the new board may not be quite as acclimated to what all has transpired. So it might be it might be good that you could work it out in December if you could. I mean, well, even then, you know, the well, dynamics the new board has changed. Will take, yeah, it'll take we'll over then. So I don't know. November really is the better choice, but. You know, that's whatever the board wants to do. It's fine with me either way, but you just got to take that into consideration because you potentially could lose three board members, you know, and have three new board members that would not be acclimated to the uh, going on with Mount Pleasant. So just take that into consideration. Right. Is everybody okay with the time, 6.30 to 8? Does that check with the principals? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. Um, well, why don't we... Lynn, I hear, I understand what you're saying. I, I think November's going to be tough, and then December. We'll just leave it to be determined. Well, let's, the let's ask then. Who, who all's going to the annual? Is, any, is anybody going to be here that's, that's not? I'm, I'm not going to the annual conference. I, I, I probably will not be able to go just okay. due to the work. Well, if we, if we okay. you know, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be all of the board, you know. I mean, maybe three or four members of the board. So it just depends on who all's going to the conference. If you're not going and I'm not going, then that's two. Well, that's a that's a different com that that's part of a different conversation of the structure of the meeting. Um, and I don't I don't know if now's the time we want to get into that or not. But the 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 structure of the meeting is it, it I mean it's going to be a called meeting that the media will be noticed. But we won't we conduct will, any business. We though. will not be conducting mm -hmm. business, but no. we will open a meeting, call a meeting to order, and then have. Anybody that wants to comment or talk to us, instead of it being like we do in here where it's only comments and we don't respond, we will have the opportunity and, and engage in conversation. But I would not want to do it with only a couple people uh, because then that's not fair to anybody that can't be there. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'll do whatever you guys want, want to do. I think November is going to be tough. My recommendation was we just leave it TBD. At, you know, we've, we've solidified two of the community meetings with times that we now can, the staff and administration can promote and tell, and the principal can get ready, and we'll just have to figure out what to do with Mount Pleasant. I think Barry makes a very good point. It may be spring, really, by the time you have actually some drawings or something to talk about. It may be the spring, and then if we have three new board members, they'd be able, they'd be up to speed and, and, and want to be able to, to participate. So, okay. I certainly want to go there with something to talk about. Okay. All right. Well, so the, the calendar changed as it's presented here, or is everybody okay with consent? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay. Ms. Monroe, we'll put that on consent, and we will move on to 4.04, uh, submission of training hours for board member Carolyn Carpenter. Does anybody have any objection to uh, submitting the training hours for Carolyn? No. Consent. Consent. I'm seeing a shaking of heads, and I'm thinking that means you're answering my question of not having a problem other than not wanting it on consent. So, okay, we're going with consent on that one, uh, Eileen. And the last item, Dr. Phillips, we would like to nominate you to the NCSBA Board of Directors. Uh, board members, he has submitted his paperwork to uh, Eileen, and uh, other than our board voting, uh, to support the nomination, there's really no other other item for us to uh, to do. In fact, I'm not sure why we're going to wait and put it on consent. 
since we have a couple action items, but I guess we'll, we'll follow what we've set up. So does ever, anybody have a question or comment they want to make? I, for one, am very pleased that you are willing to put in the time and effort to go to Raleigh for the couple times that you have to do that and be willing to uh, represent our, our area. So thank you very much, Dr. Phillips, for doing that. Anybody else have a comment that they would like to make? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> you want to double dip. Get, get that while you're up there. So consent, everybody okay with consent? Yep. Okay, fantastic. We will go to the consent, and now we will ask Dr. Van Heuchelen. We will act, we, because timing uh, for two things, we are actually going to take action on two items, 5.01 and 5.02. So we'll ask Dr. Van Heuchelen to the podium for the naming of the Early Childhood Center, the newest Early Childhood Center. Yeah, so we'd like to take action on this tonight so we can get moving on several things. You have the naming form in front of you. I'll just uh, do a quick summary. As we continue to pursue opening an early childhood classrooms at the All Saints Church, each of the agencies involved, Cabarrus County Schools, All Saints, and the Cabarrus Partnership for Children, have considered those members of our community who represent service to our children. Through this consideration, we would like to recommend that the name of the new site be in honor of Dr. David Lockhart. As you can see from the information provided in the naming form, Dr. Lockhart devoted his work to the children of our county. Additionally, he was a member of All Saints Church and served on the board of both Cabarrus Partnership for Children and the Concord School Board, bridging all organizations involved in this endeavor. It is our hope to be able to put forth a concerted effort in recruiting students and families to be involved in this center, begin working on the needed signage and other logistics, and begin hiring staff. In order to move ahead, we will need a name for the center that embodies the work that we will be doing there and believe that the Lockhart Early Learning Center captures that work. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, does anybody have a question or a comment? We're going to, uh, uh, Mr. Harrison. Um, and, and it's certainly well deserved in what uh, yourself and other uh, staff have brought to us demonstrate the stellar reputation and the great admiration and respect the community uh, has for Dr. Lockhart and his family and his memory. He's contributed more than any 50 of us put together probably that um, uh, have uh, worked in different capacities for the community over the years. But I would like to ask to what extent have we gotten buy-in from the, the existing church? Um, I, I, when we name something, I want to think that we have asked the community uh, that will be impacted by, by naming uh, something. Uh, I'm simply asking, has this church taken a formal vote um, to this effect? And shouldn't they? which I, I, I thought I mentioned in an email back to, um, uh, to, to um, the Friday report a few weeks ago. Uh, I would just like to know that the, the church is on board with us. Yeah. Okay. And forgive me, I wasn't involved in a lot of this work Dr. Natras was. Um, I, I don't believe there was an official vote taken by the congregation. I do know that Dr. Natras had worked with the current um, leadership of the church, along with the Partnership for Children, in deciding on that name. So if you're looking for a specific vote to point to that complete congregational buy-in, I don't think we can give that to you tonight. Um, it might be that I'm too Presbyterian and not Episcopalian enough, but... <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm, I'm kind of fixated upon this idea sure. that, that the church would explicitly mm -hmm. express their uh, consent for this um, decision to be made. I, I, I don't quite feel comfortable with us just making the decision uh, for the church. That's, that's my only point. Let me chime in just for a minute. Uh, David, if you remember, uh, we had a discussion on this just recently. I think it might have been in July, our July 14th meeting, where our attorney talked with us about the contract between us and the All Saints right. Episcopal Church, and the naming rights was given to Cabarrus County Schools. So they have given us the blessing of naming the school. We can name the school whatever we want to. Pardon me? Yeah, two, two new pieces of fact. One, it came through the, the what do you call it, the vestry. And we we have the consent. We have the consent. 
Yeah, and one thing that I would like to do, because need, needless to say, you know, of all the schools and different things that I've been a part of, that facilities, naming and everything, normally what we have for those new board members when it comes to naming of facilities and things like that, normally someone will come on behalf of whoever they want the school or facility named after. They'll have a representative for that. Well, since we had a naming committee on this, and Jason, with you being the one that's making this presentation, for the, uh, the pleasure of the viewing audience, a lot of folks don't know Dr. David Lockhart and his accomplishments over the years. And so what I would like for you to do, if you will, is fill the role of if you were making this presentation, although it's coming to us as a, a recommendation, and I feel sure that the board will more than likely approve this, but I would like for the community, and it won't take but just three or four minutes for you to read the bio of Dr. Lockhart, which will help these folks know the reason and uh, the reason and reasons why we feel like that this early uh, childhood center should be named after him. If you would do that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so I'm reading here from the, the, the document that's here on board docs. Um, this is put together for us um, in memory of Dr. Lockhart. Uh, the Cabarrus County Schools Elementary Department and All Saints Episcopal Church recommend naming the early childhood preschool program that will open at All Saints Episcopal Church the Lockhart Early Learning Center after longtime Cabarrus County resident and pediatrician Dr. David Lockhart, October 1922 to October 26, 2009. Dr. Lockhart was a devoted husband to Betty Sue Lockhart, as well as a devoted father to his five children, Susan, David, Becky, Jenny, and Malcolm. Additionally, he was blessed with 10 grandchildren. Dr. Lockhart served as a naval officer in World War II in the Pacific. He was a graduate of the Duke University School of Medicine, practicing pediatrics for 40 years in Concord. As a pediatrician, the health and well-being of children was foremost in his mind. Dr. Lockhart served multiple generations of families in our county and was blessed by these relationships. Through and in addition to his work, Dr. Lockhart helped establish the Children's Advocacy Center at Northeast Medical Center. This center provides support and treatment for victims of child physical and sexual abuse. Additionally, he helped establish the Cabarrus Community Child Protection Team and the Child Fertility Task Force. Finally, he assisted in establishing the Logan Community Resource Center. In addition to practicing medicine, Dr. Lockhart was an active member of All Saints Episcopal Church. He drew the plans from, for the wrought iron gates that form the entrance to the Columbarian, Columbarian, I don't know what that word is, and Bell Tower Gardens. Dr. Lockhart also served in many roles in the community. He was a volunteer pediatrician at Stonewall Jackson. He also served as a board member of the Cabarrus Partnership for Children, supporting our young, youngest learners. Dr. Lockhart was the medical director for the Cabarrus Health Alliance, as well as the chairman of the Department of Pediatrics, chief of staff for Cabarrus Memorial Hospital, and a memory of the Cabarrus County Board of Health. Dr. Lockhart was a member of the Concord School Board during the late 60s and 70s. He was also an advisor to the North Carolina State Board of Education. Even when retired, Dr. Lockhart was concerned about the children and families who were uninsured, and with his lifelong friend, George Lyles, co-founded the Community Free Clinic. His service was acknowledged with several recognitions and honors, including the 2006 North Carolina Child Health Recognition Lifetime Achievement Award, Distinguished Rotarian, Nine Who Care Award, Lions Club Layperson of the Year, Governor's Award for Outstanding Volunteer Service. Dr. Lockhart has an impact on the children and families throughout the area. His work and connections span each of the organizations involved in this partnership, Cabarrus County Schools, All Saints Episcopal Church, and Cabarrus Partnership for Children. As we embark on providing high-quality early childhood learning experiences at this new site, honoring his work in this way will remind us of the impact we are making every day for our students and families. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Van Heuchelum. And David, just to alleviate your, your concern, and your concern is noted, but if you, if you look, one of the applicants is Jackie Whitfield from the church. So I'm going to take that to mean that she's got the input along with Dr. Natras of the church as a whole. So with that... I'd like to ask for a motion and uh, that the new Early Childhood Center at All Saints Episcopal Church be named the Lockhart Early Learning Center. Mr. So Chairman, moved. I'll move for approval. Oh. Second. I, I'll second. I have a, a, a motion by Mr. Shu and a couple of seconds. A second by Mr. Walter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that, that motion passes 6 to 0. Okay, and we'll ask Dave Burnett to come back, 5.02. 
approval of the bid for the demolition of the old Odell school site. And again, time is of the essence, and so we've uh, had to put this on an action as an action item, which we'd like to do, but uh, that's what we're going to have to do tonight. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, the superintendent recommends to the board the approval of uh, JW Demolition LLC at a contract amount of $363,600 uh, for the work uh, described in the project documents. The bids were received on July 30th. Uh, we did have a uh, lower bidder that uh, provided a bid. However, they did withdraw their bid. Um, that bid was provided by Webb Harrell Construction Services Corporation, and they withdrew that bid. Um, this uh, um, project is, the, is for the complete demolition um, of the uh, structures on the Odell School site. It also includes a little bit of uh, uh, erosion control that's needed for the demolition effort. Uh, some of that work won't be wasted uh, as we will be using that in the uh, uh, in, in incorporating that into the um, final new construction effort. Uh, so the superintendent recommends to the board uh, JW demolition at $363,600. Okay, board members, uh, that's the, the, the recommendation. Uh, anybody have any questions or comments? We'll start with Mr. Walter. Is this a local company or, or is it, have we done business with them before? They have a Charlotte office. Uh, they do work in uh, North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia. Okay, so it's a fairly large, large company? It's, yes. Thank you. Mr. Schumacher? Thank you, Mr. Walker. Mr. Schumacher? No. Mr. Shu? Dave, as I mentioned to you a little earlier, I was concerned about um, allowable allowance number eight, the underground storage tanks. Do we know that there are? I mean, that's $15,000 of the three sixty three, and you know, and one of the bidders had $1,000 set aside, and then, of course, this company's got 15000 so undoubtedly one company knows more than the other company or something. And uh, I'm just a little curious about that. Well, it's certainly something that we can attempt to negotiate, but it is a price that they are providing. Um, we, we know that there is uh, one underground storage tank that was properly um, uh, abandoned. Um, as far as anything else on that site, we don't know of any other underground storage tanks on that site. Uh, if we encounter one, it will be a surprise and it's not documented. Well, I, I'd like for us to at least give that some consideration on this bid when you talk to this this uh, contractor. Okay. Say, you know, we're not 100 percent sure. We will, you know, you've charged us fifteen thousand dollars. We don't even know there's any tanks underground or not. If you find one, is it going to cost us fifteen thousand dollars to get it out, or is there some leverage there? You know, I'd I'd like to at least talk to them about that. We we can always try to negotiate that. Yeah, I think we should. Okay, thank you. And you can let us know, obviously, let us know what happened. I'm sorry? Let us know sometime in the future what the outcome of this was. Is that okay to do that, Mark? Like it that? is, but I, do, I don't well, think there's any well, uncertainty I'm about, I think we know that there is an underground storage tank that needs to be removed, there's, right? There's and we asked for a separate price, but we know that there's at least one. I guess the issue is whether there's is any Is it fuel other, oil so. or water storage tank? Fuel oil? Do you, do you it, recall it was it? a fuel oil tank. Again, it has properly been abandoned and... Uh, and and the papers have been submitted there with the state um and uh, uh at that time there's there's no issue uh, with the tank any remediation work around the site so they just gonna pull the tank out of the ground and fill the hole back in and that's well the soil miles. engineer has to be there and document that yeah. is that what you talk is that what you mean no no i'm talking about num number eight the underground storage tanks you know we've got a fifteen thousand dollar allowance for that and we don't know for sure the hundred percent that we do have a tank there and it and i'm looking at the var variances of the bids the, uh, the one was of course that guy was way off you know it was 1.2 million dollars but you know for the total bid but I just felt felt like that was, you know, quite high. Well, the, the pricing actually, one came in at thirteen thousand five hundred, uh, one came in at fifteen thousand, one came in at eighteen thousand nine hundred. Uh, again, the one at six thousand was one that you know, would discount, um, and the one at one thousand was the contractor who withdrew their bid. So really, we can't go by that one thousand um, dollars. You know, they've they've withdrawn their bid. Right. Um, and and. And $1,000 for removing an underground storage tank, um, 
I can't isn't see it being done for that. Low, no, I, I can't see it being done for that. You know, for a thousand dollars, obviously, but um, but then again, the fifteen thousand seems a little high to me. But I'm no contractor. I, I've never taken well, a store. Well, it is an allowance, so we only yeah. have to pay what it costs to pull out of the ground, unless okay. it goes over that. Okay. Now, if it goes over that, they're coming back to us with their hand out. Okay. Well, I'm with. I'm good with that then. Okay, okay Mr. Uh, Harrison. You good, Dr. Phillips? Okay. Um, yeah. So, what, what did we decide on the? I'm sorry. The, what did we decide on the first, going back to the first guy with the bid? Uh, we are pursuing um, the. Uh, uh, we're, we're pursuing what's available to us. Uh, we will look into it. Okay. So that's all the commitment we can yes. give us. All right. That's fine. <laughs> As I see Mark nodding, so that's fine. Okay. Board members, I've talked to you know we're looking at options for the first bidder okay. that's withdrawing in terms of whether they can do that. That's fine. But as far as get going forward for tomorrow, you need us to approve the the, the bid tonight so you yes. can turn them loose. Does everybody understand that? Okay. I need a motion and a second that JW demolition be approved at a contract amount of three hundred sixty-three thousand six hundred dollars for the dem demolition of the old Odell School site. I have a motion by Mr. Harrison and a second by Dr. Phillips. Did you have a comment? We need further discussion? No. I no. Okay. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Ms. Monroe, that is six to zero. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Um, now I need a motion and a second that we convene in closed session pursuant to General Statute 143-318.11A3. 143-318.11A6 and General Statute 115C-319 through 321. I have a motion by Mr. Harrison. Second. And a second by Mr. Shoemaker. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, this board is now in closed session. Yeah.